for coming to my talk. My name is Ijaz and I'm from Codify uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So, that better? So, this is a question I get asked a lot by people who are confused as to what I do. Uh, mainly it's my mum who still to this day thinks that the tokens that I design are the ones that you use in arcades. But I give her a simple answer. I say, mum, I do token design. She goes, what's that? So I say, mum, I design the microeconomic incentive systems for digital assets which drive utility on a decentralized network. And her response is usually, what? So I try again and I go, mum, I design ways to incentivize people who use decentralized networks to behave in ways that benefit the system. With tokens? And I want to focus on this last point in particular, because I think that after watching growing trends uh, in token design and token models in general, and how decentralized networks are launched, I think it's fair to say that token design has started to evolve. So let's look at some of these metrics, if you like. So I think all characteristics. Firstly, projects are starting to mature. And by that, I mean that they're building. They're building infrastructure that people can use, interfaces that make sense, and that is intuitive for a user. Secondly, there's a focus, or less of a focus, on corrupt scams and Ponzi's, mostly. Uh, I'm not gonna mention any specific names, but I heard that IOTA's had a pretty tough 24 hours. And the final thing is better questions are being asked in general. I wanna focus on this last point in particular. Now, don't be too impressed by, by my image editing skills here, but some of the questions that are being asked are, okay, so I have a token, but what does this utility serve? How do I use it? Where can I use it? Who's allowed to buy it? How is it distributed, etc. So I think in order to answer this, we need to zoom out a little bit and look at decentralized networks as a whole. So what are the key defining characteristics of a decentralized network? Well, they usually provide a service or a function. So firstly, it could be an infrastructure layer function. So this could be a second layer scaling solution like scale, for example, or it could be market specific, like prediction markets, like Augur. And the second most important thing is that it needs to be community driven. So what I mean by that is you have a bunch of stakeholders. Usually when you decentralize, you need to allow more stakeholders to get involved with how things are governed and how things are used on the network. So then when we're looking at requirements in particular, we've got to figure out a few set points. Firstly, there's governance, um, which is an iterative process. A good governance model or mechanism allows you to iterate on an existing protocol standards and rules as you move forward. The second is infrastructure. There needs to be some kind of base layer finality or node infrastructure that's being run, which helps you sustain your network economically and technically. And finally, there's economic design, which for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna be digging into a little bit more for you guys. I put tokens maybe required because I wanna make a point about utility tokens as we go along, mainly that you don't need it for everything. So the, the way that I like to think about economic design essentially is in two different buckets. You've got network design, which basically defines the parameters or boundaries within a system. Uh, it's the rules, it's the service that you provide. It defines who the stakeholders are in particular. The second thing is community interaction itself. So now that you've defined who your community participants are, your stakeholders, how do you incentivize to actually engage with this network? How do we make people act in the way that supports the network? And how do we sort of like figure out whether a token can drive utility in a sense? And I think this kind of like, sort of like surfaces a different kind of thought where new network and token design models are creating new forms of digital communities that enable anyone to interact with open ecosystems. Uh, a prime example is shown very much in this hackathon where it's very DAO focused, for example. Now, I think it's good, now that I've given you like a brief primer on token design, um, to look at where we are in Ethereum right now. So Ethereum still leads the smart contract game, if you like. They hold over 50% of the market share, closely followed, well, not really closely followed, by the likes of EOS and Tron. Um, a thing that's worth noticing to the right is uh, Tezos slowly creeping up, um, and is definitely a platform to watch carefully. Now, obviously, you want to know where all the smart contract architecture is actually being used, and probably to no one's surprise, uh, it's DeFi, which is commonly being propagated as potentially Ethereum's primary use case now as a sovereign, open banking ecosystem, potentially. Um, and this has obviously led to a sporadic growth of different networks and services within the DeFi ecosystem, 
and they funnel within several different buckets, whether it's decentralized exchange or liquidity, whether it's decentralized lending services, derivatives, you name it. And this has led to a growth of tokens. Um, I pulled this tweet from Jake Brockman. He posted it a few days ago, which I thought summarized the high-level principles of the whole blockchain ecosystem as a whole. The number of tokens grow pretty quickly nowadays. You've got a protocol token, there is a wrapper token, and then you've got to find something that aggregates all of this. And you know what? He's pretty right in that sense. I mean, DAI, the native stablecoin of MakerDAO, has several different variants, uh, usually different kinds of interest-bearing instruments. But the fact is that they, we see like myriad production of these different tokens, and its uses, uses are now putting into question who aggregates, who uses these, and why would they? But for the purpose of this talk, I wanted to focus on a few tokens which have taken my interest over the last year or so, primarily because they've done some pretty cool things with their token models, which I believe is going to become more popular over the next year or so. The first is MakerDAO. And as everyone or most people know, this is the protocol behind the stablecoin DAI, which is a cryptocurrency that maintains the one-to-one -one peg with the US dollar, and their native token is MKR. Now, the fundamental mechanism here is that the spread between um, the DAI savings rate and the stability fee is burned in Maker. Uh, Maker can also be used to vote on pro changes to protocol governance or governance in itself. Uh, for example, if you wanted to change the percentage of the DAI savings rate. Um, an interesting point that I wanted to make here is despite MakerDAO holding the largest, um, I guess, market grasp by far of the DeFi ecosystem, um, they only made 6.7, or they only generated 6.7 million dollars worth of fees due to their stability fee burning, despite being the largest holder. Um, and typically, the incentive here is if you purchase and burn Maker, um, it reduces the supply and increases the value of the holding that you have. And I think this burning mechanism is quite interesting for a variety of different reasons, and I think it's going to become quite popular as we move along. The most probably obvious being Ethereum that might implement. EIP-1559, which introduces a burning mechanism to the token. The next one I wanted to talk about was pretty cool, um, is Kyber Network. Kyber Network's an on-chain liquidity aggregator protocol, which pulls in a wide array of reserves, which allows you to securely exchange your tokens. Uh, and its native token is the Kyber Network Crystal, or KNC. Now, what's so interesting about Kyber is that they've recently announced um, the Catalyst implementation, which actually changes their token design slightly. Uh, and I've summarized kind of like the key highlights at the bottom over here. So KNC holders themselves can stake and earn network fees. Now the reserve managers, which the easiest way to think about them is they're the liquidity providers, um, will earn a percentage of the fees depending on the volume that they make. Now this is an interesting attribute that I want you to keep in your head because it starts to measure actual volume and usage on a network tied to a token versus just how a token is being used. And then you have dApps, which are now able to set their own spread of fees. Now, typically, previously on the network, they attributed a blank 30% um, on the 0.25% fee. And now they've changed that to allow just general market competition, which I thought was quite interesting. You then got 0x. I like 0x a lot. They've been around for a long, long while. And I'd argue they're one of the few protocols that have put their hands up and said, uh, maybe our token model doesn't work, but we can change it uh, and make it work and adapt it to the newer infrastructure layer that we're building. So they completely overhauled their token design in the sense that they've introduced what they call stake-based liquidity incentives, where basically, if you're a market maker, you can earn fees depending on the number of ZRX tokens that you stake, as well as the general profitability that you have in accordance to other market makers. Um, it's quite similar to Kyber in that way. Um, and if you don't want to be a market maker, what's cool here is that you can just delegate your tokens. Um, but it comes at a cost because there's a governance aspect with ZRX where if you delegate your tokens, um, the market makers themselves can control around 50% of the governance attributes that come with that. So it's an interesting model in that sense. And finally, I wanted to talk about synthetics. Um, synthetics has uh, probably had their recent rise to fame, particularly in the DeFi space. It's essentially a protocol that allows you to generate synthetic assets on Ethereum, and their native token is SNX. Uh, the way it works is you stake SNX, usually around a 750% collateral at this point, and then you can create synthetic assets called synths. Um, and whenever you trade a synth, you generate a fee. Fees are distributed to whoever is staking SNX. So it's a simple model. And I know I've just very quickly run through those token models. There's certain trends that you can listen to and pick up. So for example, 
I think that staking is quickly becoming the most popular crypto native function for utility tokens. And in fact, we actually see this in the infrastructure layer. Um, a lot of staking infrastructure and validated services uh, are maturing quite rapidly. Uh, you've got Bison Trails leading the infrastructure as a service, in my opinion. You've got large scale, large scale exchanges that are now offering staking services. Uh, you've got staking as a service independent providers, as well as native wallets now, um, like the most recent being the Ledger integration. The second thing to notice here is the reward is usually some sort of protocol native fee generation. And to go back to my earlier point about MakerDAO only making $6.7 million worth in fees, look how much Synthetics made in a very recent and rapid time. Um, they made almost $33 million worth of fees. And I, could, I expect to see this trend increase with a lot of protocols that are operating these kinds of tokens as we go forward. Um, so this got us thinking at consensus. It got us thinking about a bunch of different questions that still remained unanswered in a sense. Uh, those questions in particular were, okay, so you have networks launching and they have these tokens and they have a designated model, but who are they distributing these tokens to? Now, we've seen classic cases of airdrops, things like lock drops, uh, or different novel ways to distribute a mechanism as opposed to a traditional thing which is seen as an ICO or an IEO or whatever it might be, which is definitely just focused on raising capital. So how do we distribute tokens to a diverse and active community? And that point is important. The reason why it's important is most of these tokens get launched, distributed, and then never used. This is for a variety of different reasons. Maybe uh, the infrastructure layer hasn't actually been built up yet, so I can't use my tokens. Maybe there's no easy way to use my tokens in the first place, or maybe I just care about secondary liquidity exchange and I just want to trade my tokens. All of those don't really lead to prosperous growth of a network. The second point is, what's the easiest way to actually use my tokens and get rewarded? So I understand that the basic incentive here is I use my tokens and I get some kind of a reward. But why isn't it easy and intuitive for me to do that? The third thing is, okay, so if I understand that I use my tokens and I can earn rewards, well, how do I manage my risk here? Is there a good management interface? We've seen like loads of interfaces pop up oriented around DeFi, but what about the broader scope of infrastructural services and networks that are being launched? So in effect, what's the easiest way for me to use a decentralized network? Well, we were very proud to announce recently the launch of a product called Activate, which is a novel way to purchase and use your tokens to earn rewards through decentralized networks. So rather than give you a long and massive spiel, I'm gonna go through this as easy as possible, and if you have any questions at the end, let me know. So what is it? On Activate, it allows you to buy tokens, and with these tokens, you're allowed to use them and manage them uh, and also earn your rewards from these certain interactions that you make, all within one simple platform. Um, there's three main stakeholders that we identify that use our platform. The first is token holders, so that could be the majority of the users that jump on our platform, and they're able to essentially use their tokens seamlessly within a few simple clicks and easy to manage interfaces. Uh, they are understood and they understand the effects of earning rewards for using their tokens, and we provide analytical tools for them to be able to digest the gravity of the decisions that they're actually making. The second is, you might ask, well, what's the purpose of a decentralized network wanting to launch and activate? Like, what's the deal here if we're not focusing on just raising large amounts of capital? Well, the fact is, the most important thing for any decentralized network is effectively bootstrapping use on your network. This is important for the fostering security and network performance. So if you don't have an active community on a decentralized network, High regards is, it's, it's going to turn out quite centralized, and the service itself is going to be less than adequate. And the second thing is, we're able to distribute tokens in a very fair and transparent manner. I'm going to speak about our recent launch partner in a second, but as an example, we're engaging in a Dutch auction, which allows for much fairer price transparency and determination for users that participate in a token distribution, for example. And the final stakeholder are enablers, or something that we call enablers, which could potentially be a validator marketplace where they're able to run nodes. So what's the incentive for them? Well, they'll have simple access to people that want to delegate their tokens. Why is this important? One thing that you see with staking as a service providers is they largely have to deal with large capital funds who have like purchased a large amount of tokens, and their aim of the game is they need to kind of entice them to stake with them. With Activate, we aggregate a, a wide and diverse community of token holders that have the same initiative, which is to use their tokens. So if there is a staking function, they could simply delegate to you whilst listing on Activate, and off you go. And the final thing is you support a wider distribution of token holders. One 
sort of mechanism that I want to focus on because I'm sure a question that pops up is, well, if I'm a user and I buy tokens, I don't want to stake. Uh, I don't want to use my tokens. There's no point. I don't see any incentive. Well, we've incorporated uh, a mechanism or programmatic mechanism on Activate where anyone who purchases tokens is required to use a percentage of them for a set period of time. This is a requirement that we've set in to Activate, which guarantees a network bootstrapping of use and liquidity of usage. What this means is that you're able to generate rewards and understand how the protocol native rewards work, whilst also effectively securing a network. So with the interfaces that we're building up, and there'll be tranche launches as we go along and development gets released, um, the summary here is that you're able to utilize your tokens in a very easy, simplest interface. For example, if you wanted to delegate, you'd be able to click delegate. If you wanted to stake, you could click stake. You're able to earn rewards quite easily. The importance of how we designed our interface is to provide a macro level overview as well as a micro level overview. What that means is network stuff that happens is very complicated. So if we're able to break down, for example, how many nodes have been running in the network of which the tokens I hold right now? Uh, how many tokens are staked across the whole network? How many tokens are in a circulating supply right now? These are all pointers that are useful for me to make a decision on whether I want to stake, vote, or whatever crypto native function I wanted to do. Um, the second thing is I can now make informed decisions on my own holdings. What that means is there'll be an interface which shows you your tokens, how much is staked, your prospective um, earning potential if you were to stake on a certain interface or whatever it might be, um, and your ability to earn rewards. All transparent and live for you to aggregate. Um, and with that, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, our recent um, and valued launch partner, the Scale Network, which is a very unique partnership that we're very proud to announce, um, which we're gonna help Scale connect their token holders, validators, and dApps. Um, this has been in the works for a while now as we wanted to make sure that Scale is the project that we really wanted to launch with. They have a very mature ecosystem, they're making fantastic infrastructural progress, and more importantly, there's actually demand for use with Scale. DApps want to launch and they want to solve the scalability problem without ETH2 even being involved. There are always niche aspects to serve. And with that, I wanted to say thank you. Um, if you wanted to check out um, the platform, if you want to check out further information about Scale or what we're doing, feel free to visit our website uh, or join the conversation on our official Telegram page or the Scale Network Telegram, uh, or just pester all of us individually uh, with our very innovative Telegram handles. Um, and I'm here all weekend if you want to chat. Thank you for listening.